Good morning, Grace. It is a wonderful day to be able to worship with you this morning. As you can see, I am not in the sanctuary right now. I am out at Camp Horizon, where Ben and I had the joy of getting to walk around the grounds and see the different sights and walks and journeys that you can take when you visit here. Um, and we thought this would be a wonderful space to get some inspiration and to tell the story of our the walk to Emmaus that we are focusing on today from the Gospel of Luke. If this is the first time you are joining us and worshiping with us here at Grace, we're so glad you're here. Um, and if this is your church home, welcome back to online worship. We will be continuing worshiping online throughout the month of May, and uh, we will continue to send updates on Facebook and on our uh, Grace newsletter. With that, I wanted to give a special shout out to Camp Horizon. If you or your youth have not signed up yet for the different camps that uh, are offered throughout the summer, uh, I encourage you to do that now. There should be links provided on both Facebook and YouTube where you can sign up. There is no money asked and no deposit required. They simply want to get a feel for what numbers are going to look like for the summer. And Camp Horizon has been such an incredible part of our mission and ministry here at Grace. Uh, and we want to help them as best as we can by giving them good numbers uh, for the summer. So with that, I invite you to turn to our call to worship. Please join me in our call to worship. We come to worship eager for glimpses of the divine. Jesus of Nazareth, open our eyes so we may see. We come to worship ready to hear God's good news. Jesus, our Redeemer, open our ears so we may listen. We come to worship longing of for new evidence of life. Jesus, our Messiah, open our hearts so we may believe. Now I invite you to sing our opening hymn, Rejoice Ye Pure in Heart, verses 1 through 3, following the words on the screen or by clicking the link in the comments to sing along with the sheet music. join me in prayer. Dear God, thank you for the nurses that stay up all night to help with the sick. Thank you for our families and help those going through rough times. Be with us as we go forth into the world to spread love to everyone. In your name we pray. Amen. At this time, we invite our children to gather around the screen so that they might hear the good news that Miss Madison, our Family Ministries Director, has to offer them. Hey, Grace Kids, it's Miss Madison, and I am here outside the church this morning, 
and we are going to go on a walk today but we're gonna go on a different kind of walk um we're gonna go on a prayer walk and if you were with us at vacation bible school last year then you got to go on a prayer walk with us and this is going to be kind of similar so what we're going to do is i've written on chalk um on the sidewalk and I've written different um, prayer prompts. And so the way this is going to happen is I'm gonna walk us through it. It's gonna be the very last thing we do during this conversation. I'm gonna walk us through it and I'm gonna pray the prayer that's written. But I encourage you all to do this at home. So it's super easy. You can do this with or without chalk. So I did it with chalk so that you guys can kind of understand what, um, what we're praying about, but you could do this on your own without chalk, just walking through your neighborhood. Um, this is one of my favorite things to do when it starts to get really nice outside. And so I thought it would be a great way to talk about walking with you all. So um, the purpose of a prayer walk is to not only pray for yourself and the things that you um, want or need, but it's also to pray for the neighborhood and the people around you. So um, with this prayer walk is mainly focused on um, thanksgiving um, and giving thanks to God. But there's, um, there's a lot of different ways that you can go about a prayer walk. So if you do this at home, I would encourage you to pray for your neighborhood and your neighbors. So one really great way to do this when you're at home is to um, just walk through your neighborhood and as you walk by people's homes, if you know their names, uh, you can um, say a little prayer of thanks and also um, pray for their health and safety. Um, you can also do this if you don't know their names and, you know, maybe they live in a greenhouse and you say, Dear God, I pray for these people um, in this greenhouse and I, I hope that, um, you know, eventually we can learn who they are and learn to love our neighbors better. Um, so we're going to try this and, uh, we'll see how it goes. So let's, let's go through this prayer walk together. All right. So I put this prayer walk outside of the church, but you can easily do this in your neighborhood or wherever. Um, I apologize if it's a little loud. I'm right by the street, so I am so sorry, but will you all pray with me? Dear God, thank you for today, for our family, and for our friends. Thank you for Grace Church. And for spring, we pray for our neighbors and those who are sick or hurting. Help us to love you and one another well. Amen. Thanks, Grace Kids. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope to see you all soon, and I hope you'll try this out in your own neighborhoods. Bye. Have a good week.
Hear these words from the Gospel of Luke about the two disciples who walked to Emmaus. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And they said to him, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know of the things have have taken place here in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet in mighty deed, and a word before God and all people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be commended to death and crucified him. But I had hoped that was one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were both at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they indeed had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it was just the woman had said, but they did not see see him then he said to them oh how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared was not necessary them the messiah should suffer these things and then enter his glory then the beginning with moses and all the prophets he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. Hear what the Spirit is saying. Thanks be to God. Would you all pray with me? Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be good and pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, some of you might know this, but I, under no circumstances, will watch sad movies or TV shows. I don't know if I've always been like this, but I just cannot stand or handle the intense emotions of sadness and grief that many drama shows will offer. So some of you might be thinking, okay, well, what do you watch? I like to watch rom-coms and sitcoms. And the reason I like to watch them is for a couple reasons. One, you pretty much know exactly what's going to happen. And two, nothing that bad happens. There might be in a movie like 10 to 15 minutes when a couple is fighting or in a sitcom, maybe one to two episodes where there's some disagreement. But for the most part, The anxiety and the grief and all of the emotions don't last very long and everyone ends up happily ever after. That is my kind of show and movie. I remember I told this to my youth pastor one time and I explained to him how I just cannot handle sad movies or TV shows and he looked at me with an intense amount of sarcasm and he said, okay, well, how do you do with the story of Jesus? And I laughed because... He was right. No story, let alone our Christian story, can be told without a bit of heartbreak. And this is the emotion that we are met with today in our post-resurrection scripture. In fact, this emotion of heartbreak is what undergirds most of our post-resurrection texts. 
So for example, last week we saw in the Gospel of Matthew how the disciples are grieving the loss of their friend and mentor, and their heartbreak is interrupted by Jesus, the resurrected one, who calls them to make disciples by welcoming all and teaching love. The week before that, we heard from Bishop Sines, who uh, told us the story of Doubting Thomas from the Gospel of John, when uh, Thomas, in his grief and his heartbreak, asks for evidence from Jesus by touching the scars um, and wounds on his hand so that he might believe this resurrection story to be true. And then on Easter morning, we went back to the Gospel of Matthew and we heard the tale of the two Marys who discovered the empty tomb and their heartbreak and their grief was interrupted by none other than Jesus, this glimpse of resurrection who called them back home to Galilee. Heartbreak is what all of the disciples, all of the Jews and Gentiles throughout the land are feeling on this Easter morning. Because the world has been quiet for three days now. For the last few days, the lengthening of Good Friday has extended to Easter morning. It has been three days where the disciples are remembering all of these moments, the final days of Jesus' earthly ministry. They remember the arrest of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and the subsequent trial in Jerusalem when the crowds cheered for him to be crucified. They remember the torture and the humiliation of their mentor and their leader, and they remember the sounds of the nails clanging on the cross as his hands and feet were bound. And they remember the weight of his last and final moments when he took his last breath. This is the heartbreak that our passion story, that Good Friday holds for us. And even when we know this Easter story to be true, these disciples are still experiencing deep heartbreak at all that had occurred. And then they get rumblings of resurrection. In our story today, in the Gospel of Luke, we heard from Jackson earlier, we hear these stories of an empty tomb. The women who had gone to visit Jesus and just pay respects by offering spices prepared, they have these rumors and glimpses of resurrection. And the disciples who are hearing the women tell this story are thinking, is this really true? A few of the disciples go to check the empty tomb to see if it's all real, and when they find it empty, even then, the two disciples that we meet on the road to Emmaus are still overwhelmed with heartbreak, even though they have these moments of confusion with these rumblings of resurrection. It is in this emotion of heartbreak that Jesus comes near, meeting them exactly where they are at, and Jesus begins to walk alongside them. And the first words out of the resurrected Christ's mouth are, what are y'all talking about? Jesus asks them about their heartbreak and Cleopas begins to tell the story. He talks about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet in mighty deeds and actions, and he was crucified by the chief priests and leaders. And then Cleopas reveals the most heartbreaking words of all. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. You see, for these men of faith, they had grown up hearing the stories of Moses and the teachings of the Torah. They had heard of the prophet's stories of a suffering servant who would carry the weight of people's grief and sorrow. They knew of this child born into poverty to Mary and Joseph, a virgin no less. And then they had witnessed Christ's earthly ministry, where he was able to bless the poor, heal the sick, raise a little girl back from the dead, and feed the 5,000. So these two men of faith had built up hope in this man who could fulfill their sacred text who would redeem their people, or so they thought.
us, but we had hoped. For these two, and for the people of the Hebrew faith, the death of Jesus did not fulfill their hope. Rather, their hope failed them. It failed Israel. And now they were walking in their heartbreak to Emmaus. But Cleopas continues telling the stranger about the confusing morning they have had when the women came and they shared about the empty tomb and about this vision of angels who claimed that Christ is alive. Then some disciples in their group went to confirm again that the tomb was empty and even though they saw with their eyes, they did not see Jesus with their own eyes. So as Cleopas recounts the story, this stranger walks with them, and he listens to them. He meets them in their heartbreak. And while, ironically, we as the readers two millennia later know that this stranger is actually the only one who knows the truth of the story, Jesus still walks alongside them in their sadness and their grief and their confusion. But eventually, Jesus speaks his next words. Oh, how foolish you are. I wouldn't say this is the most pastoral delivery, but Jesus eventually interrupts their heartbreak to walk them through the story again of what really happened to this prophet, prophet from Nazareth. And he starts from the very beginning. And he recounts these same stories of Moses and the Israelites who wander in the wilderness. He tells the tale of the prophets Elijah and Elisha who lead their people once they get to the promised land. He tells of the prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah who cast visions of hope of a redeemer in this time of political and military strife. And then he reminds the two disciples walking along the road of Jesus of Nazareth's own teachings, his own predictions of his death, how this suffering indeed was a fulfillment of their hope. And it wasn't a deviation from the plan. I can't imagine how Jesus must have been feeling in this moment. I mean, he wasn't really hiding his identity at all. He didn't disguise himself as a stranger. He wasn't being ambiguous in his teaching and his storytelling. And yet these disciples are so blinded by their own grief and heartbreak that they can't even see what is right in front of them, who is right in front of them. I imagine Jesus walking along, alongside them and thinking, are you serious? I told you this was going to happen. I even sent women to confirm the miracle of the empty tomb. I sent angels to tell the story of resurrection. And the disciples saw evidence with their own eyes, and yet y'all cannot see beyond your own heartbreak. Jesus walks with them in their grief, but he also tries to wake them up to the fact that they are the ones keeping themselves from resurrection. They are missing new life right in front of them. They weren't expecting hope. They weren't expecting resurrection. They weren't expecting Jesus. So the good news in this story is twofold. God walks with us in our heartbreak, meeting us exactly where we are at, God honors our pain and our need to talk it out and our process of grief. But God also doesn't let us just sit there. We keep walking. God invites us to open our eyes and to expect resurrection. And sometimes God does this in shocking ways, like calling us fools and slow of heart. Because sometimes when we get in our way, in our very own way of new life, a little wake-up call is needed. And like the two disciples, what might we be missing on our walk with God? Are we expecting God? Are we expecting resurrection? Are we paying attention to our story? Are we opening our eyes to strangers in our midst, to angels we might not even know we are walking with? As all of us know, we are in a season of heartbreak. Some of us haven't seen our family and friends for weeks. Some of us haven't hugged another person in over a month. Some of us are worrying each and every day about our loved ones who are on the front lines. 
And even though our time of social distancing is supposed to change tomorrow as a state, some of us aren't really feeling ready to risk it. We worry about the health of ourselves and our loved ones and our neighbors. We are in a season of heartbreak. But God is inviting us to keep walking, to keep moving and to not sit in our grief. God is inviting us to open our eyes to resurrection, sometimes things that are smack in front of us and sometimes things that feel a little more subtle and more difficult to perceive. We are called to expect God. When I moved here in July of last year, I was feeling a whole host of emotions. I was exhausted and run down from working full-time as a youth pastor and full-time as a student. I was pretty numb when it came to the goodbyes of friends um, that I called family in my life in Chicago. I was super excited to begin this new adventure in Winfield and also feeling a little nervous that I wasn't prepared. Good thing I took Pandemic 101 in seminary. But more than anything, the first month I moved here, I was feeling really heartbroken. I had just gotten out of an important relationship, one that was causing me to say the same words as the disciples, but I had hoped. In that month, I went to visit Camp Horizon for the very first time. I drove up with Britt to come and get a tour from Ben, who was leading during high school camp. We took a golf cart and drove around seeing the beauty of Camp Horizon and we got to gather for worship and I saw the sun setting in the west outside and I decided to go see for myself. So I went on a walk and I sat down out by the outdoor chapel and I prayed and I cried and I prayed and I cried and then I was quiet. And in that moment, I remember really vividly expecting God. I was in no way thinking God was going to come down from the clouds or even walk up to me on the path, but I was expecting God to show up. I expected that my heartbreak would become resurrection. And I didn't know how, and I didn't know when, but I expected it to come. Because if God can rise from the dead after three days, who am I to be the one getting in the way of resurrection in my own life? because God has and does and always will meet us in heartbreak. And he invites us to keep walking and wake us up again for moments of new life. Next week, we will see the story continue on this walk to Emmaus as we hear what happens when the disciples' eyes are finally opened. In the name of the one who calls us home and walks with us on our own journeys, amen. Please join me now in our collective prayer of confession. Holy God, we confess that sometimes our own heartbreak and grief can get in the way of seeing you in our midst. We have failed to expect you and to expect resurrection in our daily lives. Forgive us, God of love, and walk with us in our loss. Open our eyes so that we may welcome strangers bringing wisdom of new life and angels without knowing it. Hear the good news. Christ meets us in our heartbreak and prompts us to keep walking. May we expect God and resurrection to transform our grief. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. At this time, we will be hearing a glimpse of grace from one of our grace members, Lou Helzer, who is an avid walker herself, and she shares a bit about how she sees God on her walks. As many of you know, I like to walk a lot. Many times I walk with someone, but during this time of social distancing, I have been walking alone. No, that's not right. I've been walking with God. It has been, it has been amazing how much more I see and am aware of on these walks. I have watched the first flowers of spring, 
Persithia, tulips and daffodils bloom. Then came the buds of leaves on trees and lilacs that scented the air as I went by. Now I see iris and some roses. I have been listening more too. The birds all have beautiful songs that fill the air. As I walk, I try to give thanks for all the beauty I see. The blue sky, clouds, wind in my face, and I am aware of the blessing of just being a part of this world. And in all of this beauty that I see, hear, and feel, I am aware that God is with me and will continue to be with me and with you during this crazy time. In spite of everything, we are loved and cherished, and we'll get through this. How blessed we are. For the next few minutes, we will be holding space for us as a faith community to offer ourselves in both prayer and gifts. As members, we commit to being a church family who prays for one another and who gives back to the church financially so we can live into our mission of welcoming all to grow in grace. You will see different slides on the screen with joys and concerns shared by our church and the different ways that you can give both by check through the mail or online or by text giving. If you have additional prayer requests, please add them on YouTube or Facebook in the comments at this time. If you are a visitor to our church family, we invite you to participate as you are comfortable. If you have prayers to offer, please share them. If you would like to give financially, we welcome that. Bottom line, we are so glad you are here and decided to worship with us this morning. And if you are looking for a church family to join whose mission is one of welcome and love, please reach out either on Facebook or by calling our office during office hours. Now let's go to God in this time of offering. For all of these shared and unshared prayers, God, we offer them to you. We especially lift up our country, Lord of all nations, as many states and counties begin to reopen. For our leaders making impossible decisions, we pray that your wisdom and discernment guide them forward. May we have grace for our local, state, and country officials who are balancing more factors than we could possibly imagine. For our hospitals filled with doctors, nurses, medical staff, and volunteers, we pray for strength and health in this transition. For all those returning to work and attempting to rebuild businesses, may they feel the outpouring of support from the local community, and may your presence guide them in this endeavor. As people of faith, may we pray for action that preserves the sanctity of life, especially for the most vulnerable, over the temptation of profit. Holy One, as we celebrate May Day, a day to acknowledge the beauty of spring, may we not forget to honor the workers around the world who gathered to demand basic rights, such as healthcare benefits, personal protective equipment, and paid leave. We pray that these workers feel they are truly essential, not disposable, based on our policies and actions rooted in love of neighbor. We pray this and so much more in the words that your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hear these words of benediction. God meets us in our heartbreak and invites us to keep walking. May we open our eyes to expect God and expect resurrection. Stay safe, be well, and keep washing your hands. See y'all next week.
Is it's the break? That's the break. Is it good now that I've broken it? No, it's fine. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> wow.